this morning. We're so glad you're here. Let's all stand together and we'll join the choir on that second verse. Crown him the Lord of love. Here we go. Crown him the Lord of love. Behold his hands and side. Rich wounds yet visible above. In beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fall. standing for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, the Lord, we thank you for this place that we come and we worship you in. Lord, we just pray that uh, you'll bless the services, um, the singing of the choir and the playing of the beautiful music, Lord, and we uh, uphold uh, our honor to the Lord. And Father, I just pray that as the preaching is uh, broken up to us today, that we might understand it. And um, perhaps there's someone here that has never uh, heard a clear message of uh, saving power of God. And perhaps this would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We never can thank you enough. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, this will be our handshake song. After the second chorus, we'll turn around and have a little fellowship time. We're going to sing 529. Oh, how I love Jesus. We love him because he first loved us. Amen. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word, it sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth, oh. tells me of his precious blood the sinners perfectly sing it out oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus because he first loved me turn around and shake hands
Please join us on the fourth verse. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Thank you. You may be seated. And now the choir will sing. choir man wasn't that good that was good thank you so much choir for that beautiful song and uh good morning good to see you here at cornerstone baptist church we're so glad that you're here looking forward to a great day in god's house this morning i have a few announcements to share with you uh start with ice cream because who likes ice cream here Anybody like ice cream i thought so uh right tonight right after the service we're having an ice cream social and the teams will be giving the ice cream out for uh donations because they're trying to get to camp remember that okay uh, and so looking forward to the ice cream social tonight. And if you're able to, please stay afterward. And also tonight we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. So looking forward to observing that with our church family tonight. Also, there's no men's prayer breakfast uh, this month in June with everything that we have going on. Uh, just so we're not going to uh, have a pr men's prayer breakfast this month, but we definitely will in July. 
and look forward to spending some time together as men. Uh, thank you so much for those that brought in uh, individually wrapped candies and also the toys for the VBS. And so thank you so much for that. We will keep taking those all the way up until um, two weeks from now when VBS takes place. And everyone who prayed and helped out with the kids club, man, that was a tremendous success. Yesterday was our first one of the summer and we had 17 kids there, 17 kids and uh, just looking forward to just a, a great week next week and praying the Lord builds that thing all the way up into VBS. And so continue to pray for us as we continue uh, the kids programs this summer. Also, we have next Sunday morning, we have um, Landmark Baptist College Choir, uh, not choir, Landmark Baptist College Singing Group, the men's singing group that's from my home church, the college that I graduated from. Their singing group is going to be in town. They're going to be with Brother McNair, and so we're going to steal them for Sunday morning, and so looking forward to having those men with us Sunday morning. Uh, my wife's baby shower will be June 12th after the Sunday p.m. service. So if you're interested in bringing in some refreshments, please sign up the sign-up sheet in the lobby. So much going on. We have the summer day camp uh, going on June 11th and June 18th, and we always would appreciate more workers for that. And then Senior Patriots is coming up real quick, June 18th, uh, later, uh, earlier on in the morning, and uh, look, looking forward to that. The sign-up sheet's in the lobby. And be in prayer for the Friends and Family Day. Friends and Family Day, it'll be June 26th, the Sunday after VBS. We're having all the families of those that attended with their children. They're going to be doing the songs and memory verses that they learned in VBS. We're inviting all of them to come. And we're also having you guys invite all of your friends and family to come with us. It's going to be a great day. Uh, hamburgers, hot dogs, cornhole, bounce houses, Facebook. Uh, not Facebook, face painting, face painting. Um, and so a lot of great things. So get the word out. There's flyers in the lobby. Hand someone a flyer. And we were able to hand out 130 bags with gospel tracts, Bibles, and uh, information at the ballpark yesterday. Had a lot of great responses. Looking forward to a great day. Also, those that helped me out with the mail-out ministry. Thank you so much. And you don't really see firsthand the fruit from that. But several people that were at the kids club yesterday said, we're so thankful that we opened up the envelope. I'm a single mother, didn't know what I was going to do with my children this summer. We wanted to get them involved and opened up your letter in the mail. And now they came and they're going to come back next week and bring friends. So many other people that are planning on coming to the VBS were a direct result from our mail out ministry. And you have a, you ladies that stuffed have a part in that. Okay. So thank you so much for that. Looking forward to a great summer. And we'll go ahead and pray for the offering. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have someone in town who's a visitor with us, Brother uh, John Larrabee. He's going to be candidating, uh, praying about being the school administrator. And so he's here. And so make sure you introduce himself, yourself to him. And he's been a real blessing to us already. And then also, Brother Berger has an update on Mrs. Berger. And so, Brother Berger, if you wouldn't mind uh, coming up and giving us a quick update about Mrs. Berger. And then right afterward, we'll pray for the offering. Thank you, Pastor. I figured it'd be easier than trying to talk to every individual. So, her situation is this. The stone that she had was hard enough that they had to break it up. There's still some in there. So, the bile, I don't understand all this, that comes through the duct to go into her pancreas, or from her pancreas to her bladder, which she doesn't have. Anyway, it is formed to growth, so... At a future date, they're going to remove that so there won't be any problems. So at the present time, we're waiting to hear from the doctor to come in for a uh, pre-surgery uh, evaluation. Uh, she's doing good. She's feeling good. She didn't sleep for anything last night. It's the reason she's not here this morning. So just give you a quick update. Uh, the surgery was partially successful. Uh, he had to put a stent in so he could reach it. Of course, that'll come out. So, um, hope I haven't confused you. Uh, there's a lot to swallow even for me, and I was there talking to the doctor. So, thank you, Pastor, for letting me update everybody at one time. And if you have any further questions, um, I'll be available. Thank you much, and I appreciate your prayers, and she does too. We, we need those. Thank you.
All right, let's pray for our offering. God, we thank you for guiding doctors' hands as they did the surgery for Mrs. Berger, and and that uh, it looks like after another surgery, it'll be a complete success, but we thank you for that answer to prayer, and just uh, help her to be able to sleep and have her complete recovery, and we are so blessed in so many ways, beginning with salvation and then everything you give to us after salvation. As as we're able to give back some to you, we pray that we do it joyfully and we use it wisely. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together, please, with me, and we'll sing song number four, How Great Thou Art. (coughs) And sing all four verses, song number four. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. Son, 
not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And junior church kids, it's time to go ahead and go to the back to meet your leader there. All nice and strong on the fourth. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Good singing, you may be seated please. God reigns in holy perfection, sinless, so pure, no stain. The very thought of sin loses his anger, his thunderous wrath set against hell's domain. My life began in condemnation, sinful and destined to die. On my own, I found no consolation until the day a spotless lamb heard my cry. My blessed Savior is standing in the presence of God, declaring that I've been made clean. Holy God who looks within cannot see my sin. There is a precious lamb who stands in between. Now there is no condemnation. I know such freedom from sin. There's not a doubt that I'll cross heaven's portal as God declares that I'm sinless within. a 
precious lamb who stands in between. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. precious lamb that stands in between. Your Bible turn with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 15 together. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. And uh, I love the music so far. If you can't tell, it's got a gospel thread through it. Uh, man, it's, I, I love it. I love it. And Sunday morning, this message is going to be about the gospel. It's going to be about the gospel, what the biblical gospel is. And hopefully challenge us that are saved to, uh, to get a burden for getting that biblical gospel out to the lost. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior... Hopefully it will give you a burden for your own soul this morning. And not leaving this place today without knowing for sure that you know the precious lamb that stepped in between for you. How that you can know for sure that you can be passed from death into life and experience the joy and peace that comes with knowing him as your savior. The gospel in Galatians is what the Lord's laid on my heart this morning. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 1, the Bible says this. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us From this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And that's how serious the Apostle Paul takes the biblical gospel in the defense of that biblical gospel. And we'll get there in a moment. But verse number 10, the Bible says, For do I now persuade men of God, or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men... I should not be the servant of Christ. Verse number 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And profited in the Jews' religion above my equals, above many my equals, in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to receive his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh. In blood, And we'll pause there and get right into it this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for Cornerstone Baptist Church that we can come into and we feel like we've been in God's presence. We feel like we come to church 
and not uh, uh, a night scene, a nightclub, but we feel like we've come to church and already, God, through the, the singing and through the fellowship with your people, we've been in your presence. And I'm so thankful that we have a church that still feels like church. And I pray that you would just help me as their messenger to share the simple thought about what the biblical gospel is. And I pray that you would just hide me behind your cross and take the preaching and, and the word of God and take it and plant it into every single heart today, Lord. And if there's someone here that does not remember a time or a place in their life where they've called on you in faith and they repented and turned to you in faith, I pray that the day would be the day of their salvation. And Holy Spirit of God, go to every heart, go to every pew, go to every person and speak to our hearts, Lord. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The gospel in Galatians, as, as many of the books that, and epistles that Paul has written, the theme is the gospel. If you know Paul, if you study Paul for any length of time, his, his life's purpose was entwined with the gospel. Everything he did, it seems like every chance he got, whether it's standing in front of a, a Roman ruler, in front of King Agrippa, or just standing in a marketplace, he was sharing what Jesus Christ has done in his life, and he began to share with anyone that would give ear about the gospel. And in this chapter, in Galatians chapter 1, it's no different. Paul is sharing the gospel, but specifically, he is validating the gospel that he spent his ministry preaching. He's defending the biblical gospel that was given to him. In verse number 1, we see that Paul states that his authority and his position as an apostle is not given to him by man. He was not made uh, the, what he was by a man, but it was God that gave him the authority to write what we read him writing. And he is validating that authority. Verse number two, we see that Paul is addressing in this epistle the church of Galatia. And then in verses three and four, we see that uh, we see three point of the three point of the gospel message in the verse. We see that Jesus giving himself and dying and paying for our sins. Isn't that a key component of the gospel? And then we see that through his sacrifice, he delivered us from hell and the embondagement of sin and making us free. And we uh, celebrated Memorial Day and we're thankful for the sacrifice of our brave uh, men and women in our military that gave the ultimate sacrifice their life for our liberty and freedom as Americans. But I'm so thankful that we have liberty in Christ in the truest sense of the word liberty. And that's what's being referenced here as well. And then Jesus did this in obedience to his father's will. Did it in obedience to his father's will. Do you understand this morning that I'm going to share with you the heart of God is that everybody accepts him as, his, as their savior. God's will, the father's will is that everybody might come to repentance. That's God's will. God's desire is that everyone choose him as their savior and be saved. But the reality is there are many people in hell today. Because of the free will that they had to choose for themselves. And many have chosen to reject the biblical gospel that I'm fixing to share with you. Let, verse number 5, Paul, like he always does, gives Christ the glory. And then in verses 6 to 14, he goes into great detail defending the biblical gospel. And we're going to jump right into it, what the biblical gospel is. But before we do that, before we de describe to you what the biblical gospel is, I want to point out something to you here. I want to point out, look at it with me in verses 6 and 7. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says this, I marvel that ye, ye, you, you, you Christians, you, you church of Galatia, ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I am not one of those people that will take Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 and preach that you can lose your salvation. I believe he was rebuking the church after he giving them the gospel that they apparently responded to in faith and belief for themselves, but now they would turn their back on the very same gospel that they themselves uh, received and believed Christ, and now they've turned on that, and now they're preaching some other gospel. He's rebuking them for that, which is not another. What does that phrase mean? preaching another gospel, but it's not another. Do you understand? There is, there's, nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. 
There's nothing new under the sun. And when someone preaches a gospel that differs from the word of God, it's not a new gospel. Do you know what it is? It's just the true gospel perverted. That's what it is. And what you see is all the the different denominations out there, the different religious systems out there, they don't have a new gospel. They've just just, uh, commandeered the one true biblical gospel and, and twisted it and perverted the true gospel. And that's what Paul is referencing here. It's not another gospel. It's just you've taken the true biblical gospel and you've twisted it so where it's uh, not recognizable anymore. But the Bible goes on to say this. It says, if any man... Well, preacher, how, how serious, how strongly should we take this? And how strongly was the Apostle Paul about this? Look what it says. It says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And let me tell you, there are plenty of those out there all around us from this property today that would trouble people. What what does that talk about? How would churches trouble an individual? I'm telling you what, uh, churches would trouble an individual by preaching to them that their eternal salvation is wrapped up in how much they put in the offering plate. There are churches out there that make what you give to Christ and the cause of Christ be what you uh, be into what secures your salvation. The Catholics, right? Uh, how, how effective is that? You, you drive around town and see all the uh, wonderful, beautiful, immaculate properties and buildings and structures that they have. Well, it, it shouldn't surprise you that they have the facilities that they do when they tell their people that it, determining how much you give is where you're going to go to heaven or not or purgatory or whatever. Corrupting the gospel. They trouble people. Those that preach any other gospel. How seriously should we take this matter this morning? Look at it in verse number 8. The Bible says this. But though we, the apostles like Paul, we, disciples, apostles like Paul, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be what? Accursed accursed that's that's pretty serious strong language isn't it doesn't matter who it is doesn't matter if you see a vision and uh, some angel gives you some golden scrolls and the vision tells you to do something and start a cult and draw a following to yourself anybody preaches any other gospel let him be accursed and verse 9 also says and we said before so say I now again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be accursed and i know i know that we may have some folks from different church backgrounds here we i know we may have some different views on different things and i don't want to be purposely nasty i want to be right positionally but i want to be right also dispositionally too i'm not trying to purposely be rude to you but i've got an obligation as a preacher of righteousness to preach the whole counsel of god and i got i got i got a responsibility to tell you what god says in his word and then share god's biblical message and if that counters what you've been taught somewhere else we've got to go with god got to go with god before we get into the biblical gospel here's some examples we talked about there apparently were back then in those days false gospels being preached Here's some examples today, and like I said, I'm not trying to be nasty, but it's true. There are different religious systems out there that preach different gospels that are, that are wrong. They're just wrong. Here's some examples. People that preach works-based salvation is wrong, and they should be cursed. They should be ashamed of themselves for troubling the people that they do, saying that they have to work to secure either their own salvation or, yes, salvation was initially by faith, but you have to do works to stay saved. That's wrong. That's wicked, people. And the Bible says those people should be ashamed and also should be counted unto us as a curse. What does the Bible say? And that's what should matter to us. What the Bible says about the matter. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, uh, familiar verses, I'm sure. But the Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. What does the Bible say? Not of what? Works. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Galatians chapter 2.16 says this. 
knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I don't think we'd have any argument against works-based salvation here. Am I right? Okay, but here's another thing. And I, once again, I'm not trying to step on your toes. And if I did, you probably should have worn steel toe boots this morning, okay? But I'm going to step on your religion for a moment. Do you understand there are a lot of people who literally are trusting in and clinging on desperately to their religion and hoping that by their religion, they're going to go to heaven. And I, I'm going to quote, so you don't get mad at me, get mad at Brother Roloff, he's dead now. But I heard Lester Roloff say on the radio uh, program, on the Family Altar radio program, he said there's one thing that's sent more people to hell than anything, and it's religion. And if you understand what he's talking about, you would agree with him. People that are trusting in to their very last breath, holding on to their religion and the traditions that fit into that religion, and they think that that is going to be what gains them access to heaven. And folks, your religion is not going to do that. It doesn't matter what religion you belong to, denomination you belong to, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ and placing your faith and trust in him alone for salvation. And people out there that promote the traditions of man and the, the traditions that come along with religious observances in my opinion and estimation, are just as wicked as the works-based salvation people. What, what does the Bible say about religion? People elevate their religion so much. What does the Bible say what religion is? James chapter 1 verse 27 says this, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. This is what the King James Bible attributes uh, religion being. Let me ask you something. Is helping widows and uh, meeting the needs of others and having a heart for their, for their needs in, in, in our sanctification and being set apart as believers, it, are those good things? Absolutely. But are they good enough to secure your salvation and go to heaven? No. Not, 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 not what the Bible tells me. The danger with people believing in their religion is that they are consumed with their tradition. And there are a lot of traditions out there. I'm just going to make some people mad this morning. It's not my intention, okay, but you might get mad, all right? Traditions. We have Wednesday night service, okay? We have a Wednesday night service, midweek service. Do you understand there are some churches being independent Baptist churches that have their midweek service on a Thursday, okay? Are they wicked for having a midweek service on a Thursday? No, no. But some people, I've been in churches that got fired up. I'm telling you what, got fired up. How dare they have their midweek service on a Thursday? I can't believe that. That's blasphemy. Well, well why? Well, bless God, we've always done it on Wednesday. I'm with you. I've always been to church on Wednesday. But if they have it on Thursday, who cares? They're in church. But people elevate their tradition and their, and their religion as Bible, and it's not. We have, I don't know what you call that color pew. Is that mauve? Mauve. Mauve colored pews. Back home in Florida, we had royal blue pews. Every pew in church should be royal blue. Where is that in the Bible? But people get all fired up and elevate their religion when it's just not, it's not as important as they think it is. And then here's another example. You go to these churches, and I love music. I love music. I can't sing, and I, I play the radio. I don't play any instruments really well. I love music, but you go to some churches, and the preaching is almost an afterthought. You go to a service, and it's just, a, it's just a, a music concert. Oh, man, there's 10 minutes left, and they get up, and they do this little sermonette, and they just speak life to you, and they just speak to you, and you leave there thinking, I, I used gas to come here? If I want to listen to music, I just put in a CD in my car. I don't know about you, and I know I'm the preacher, so of course you would say that you're a preacher. I love preaching. I love preaching. And I want to be fed, and you should too. When you go to choose a church to belong to and, and, and be a part of, I'm telling you what, find a good Bible-believing, doctrine-based, doctrine-centered preaching, Baptist church, 
and get a part of that church. If you go in there and the, and the music takes preeminence over preaching, you leave as, soon as, as fast as you came. That's what you should do. If you go in there and the preacher is tiptoeing around the Bible and not preaching everything that comes up in the Bible, you need to leave as fast as you came out of that church. You should find a church that's focused on preaching doctrine. Doctrine is the most important thing of why you join a church, not if the pews are royal blue or mauve. You should find a church that believes like you do and preaches biblical doctrine like you want to be fed by. In a lot of churches around here, I've been a part of two on vacation and others, they, they have a watered-down gospel. They preach a watered-down gospel. They don't tell people that they're a sinner that's broken God's law as a lawbreaker, a transgressor of God's law, and that stands guilty in the eyes of a holy, righteous God. And because of them standing guilty before a holy, righteous God, the punishment, like any law that's ever broken, has a punishment. And that consequence is to be eternally separated from God's presence in hell in the lake of fire. Well, Brother Morton, that's offensive. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. It's, it's the truth. That's the gospel that we're going to get to here in a moment that we should be preaching to people. Not a watered down gospel that we just cut out the parts that may offend people. I'm glad that on July 31st, 2011, my preacher back home spared no punches, didn't worry about tiptoeing around my toes. He stepped all over my toes that night. He preached the biblical gospel. I became under biblical conviction, and I followed the Lord and accepted him as my Savior on July 31st, 2011. I can't help but think if my preacher had the mindset of, well, church growth is the most important thing, and the only way that I've read in these books that people have uh, marketed as church builders have put out, and uh, the preaching a biblical gospel is going to be counterproductive than you build in your church, so don't preach a biblical gospel. I'd rather build the kingdom of God than build a great, huge, mega church here on earth. That's what I'd rather focus on being a builder of, and preaching the gospel is, is the most important thing. Now, what is the biblical gospel? Go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll look at it in verses 1 through 4. I'm telling you, if you wanted just a beautiful picture in just a few verses of what the Bible definition of the gospel is, man, this is a great place to turn to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, the Bible says this. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory, excuse me, what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And he's already established in Galatians, he's already said it, the gospel he's received that he's referencing here in 1 Corinthians was not a gospel he received from man. He received from the revelation of God. The gospel that I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. It's the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some people would shortcut it and say it's the good news, and it is good news, but specifically, it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've had people given the gospel to them. And I said, hey, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for you? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you believe that he was buried? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Do you believe that he, was, he rose again from the dead? No, I don't believe that. Nobody can rise from the dead. Are, should I have gone any further and just rushed them through a prayer and put their name on a card? Friend, if they don't believe that Jesus was God enough to resurrect from the dead, they're placing their faith in an empty, vain procedure is what they're doing because you have to believe that anybody can die but the thing that validated who he was was his death burial and his resurrection from the dead you're putting your faith not in a, 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 a stack of bones in a graveside you're putting your faith in a resurrected uh, alive lord that's seated in heavenly places up high and so it's the biblical gospel is the death the burial and the resurrection uh, of jesus christ what are the biblical components of the gospel? The Bible says, by grace, by grace. And some people smarter than me define it like this, grace. The unmerited favor of God. 
It's the unmerited favor of God. It's receiving something that we do not deserve. Receiving something that we don't deserve. It's only by the grace of God that we have the opportunity that we have to be saved. Through faith, through faith. And I believe this. I believe this all my heart. Uh, some people struggle with uh, not having enough faith to get saved. Well, I just don't know if I have enough faith. And they think that they have to have all this uh, huge amount of faith. I believe this. If everybody has a grain of mustard seed worth of faith, to just take at face value what God through his word says and put their faith in that, that's all it takes. I believe this with all my heart too. I believe that God has measured out, you see that phrase, measured out uh, faith, measured the right amount of faith that everyone needs to hear the gospel and receive him as their savior. Everybody has enough faith to get saved inside of them right now. It's just a matter of fact if they choose to believe it or not. You have the theologians that would argue that it's too simple. You have the skeptics that say it's, uh, it's, um, it's, not, uh, it's not logical. And everybody else that would argue it away. And the Bible says, you know what? All you need to do is have a faith of a child. For such is the kingdom of God. It's to have enough faith as a child. My son, it's kind of scary, but my son will do anything I ask him to do. If I say, son, go running that face forward in that wall, okay, d -d 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 hit, hit the wall. He'd do it. He's on, he's, on top of the, he's on top of the couch. And I say, Connor, jump here. And he just, everything he has is jump straight out to me. Do you know what he's, ex ex uh, you know what he's showing? He's showing forth, he's showing forth faith. Now, he doesn't have the understanding yet of everything that that means, but he just knows if daddy tells me to jump, I'm trusting daddy's outstretched arms to catch me. And this is a pretty cheesy illustration to prove my point, but that's what faith in, in coming to Christ and salvation is. It's Jesus Christ is, is saying, believe me that I am what it takes to be saved, and I'm here, and I will take care of you if you trust me. And it's just taking just the jump off the couch into God's arms and believing him, and that's what it takes. Some people uh, put down um, that I'm an easy believer. And I know that easy believer gets lumped in with other things that I don't believe. I don't believe in just rushing people through a prayer um, without understanding and things like that. Well, let me ask you a question. They put that down. At, like I'm an easy believer. Like I, I, the biblical gospel is all that it takes. How hard, it, how hard it should it be? I mean, if God sent his son who took on the sins of the world, put it on himself, went to the cross and shed his blood and died and said it's finished, What's left that's difficult? What's left that he requires is to by faith receive his gift. That's pretty easy, isn't it? That's pretty easy for someone to get saved. So I do believe in an easy gospel. It's easy. God's done through his son, Jesus Christ. He's done all the hard work. He's done all the hard work. So here's, some, here's some scripture verses for you. For uh, scripture verses about believing for salvation. What the Bible says uh, it requires. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved. John three sixteen says for God so the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Acts chapter 16 verse 31 says and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. I'm going to give you quick things, and we'll be done here. A sinner is saved. I'm going to give you a couple of things. By, number one, a presence of the gospel. A presence of the gospel. Do you understand, someone doesn't have to be sitting in a church auditorium to hear the gospel and be saved. That's why we do what we do in outreaches and soul winning and different things where we take the gospel out to them and present the gospel to them. Uh, they're saved. A sinner is saved by a presence of the gospel. That presence can be found in different things. It can be found uh, in, in a track, a gospel track. It can be found in a personal witness over a gospel radio program. It could be uh, on a TV program, on, on Bible preaching podcasts. Those are the different uh, avenues that the gospel is presented, but everybody is saved by some presence of the gospel or another. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, the Bible says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? They're saved by a presence of the gospel. Someone, a sinner, is saved by, number two, a powerful drawing, a drawing of the Holy Spirit. A powerful drawing of the Holy Spirit. When you got saved, when I got saved, uh, our experiences aren't exactly the same about where we were when we got saved and who was presenting the gospel when we got saved. But friend, everybody in this place today was saved because the Holy Spirit of God took the message in whatever form that it was presented to you and drew you to the point in your life where you had to make a decision and receive him as your savior. It drew you to the point when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ. A powerful drawing of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 6 verses uh, 44, the Bible says this, No man, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. What's the next two words? Draw him. Draw him. And I will raise him up at that last day. I'm telling you what, people can preach uh, some moving messages and can tell you uh, some stories that tug on your heartstrings. And a preacher can pound the pulpit and run up and down the pul- uh, on, the, on this platform and just pour out his heart. But you know at the end of the day, what it takes for a believer to get saved is not to be emotionally stirred. It's the drawing of the Holy Spirit that doesn't come from antics from a preacher. I'm convinced of this, okay? I could sit down here in a chair, read monotone, and somebody still gets spoken to. You know why? Because the power of God has very little to do with my dynamics as a speaker. The power of God comes from the Word of God that the Holy Spirit of God takes and plants it in the heart and draws all men to himself. Now, there are different attention spans of people and things that a speaker needs to do to maintain, uh, maintain control of the attention, but ultimately the power comes from God, and he's the one that draws anybody to the point of choosing him as their savior. And then we see a, a sinner is saved not only by a presence of the gospel, a powerful drawing of the Holy Spirit, but number three, a personal response to the gospel. A personal response to the gospel. Nobody can get saved in here for anybody else. Trust me, if I could, I'd be saved right now for my dad, my brother, and my sister. But nobody can get saved for somebody else. They must personally choose for themselves what to do with the gospel message. You, as the instrument that God uses to present the gospel to someone... You know our responsibility, where our responsibility ends as a witness for Christ? Is at the moment that we go and we preach and teach and share the gospel with them, the burden of responsibility is completely on the individual's shoulders. The ball's in their court. They now have to decide what they do with it. And from that moment forward is a personal response to either accept it or reject it. They respond. How they respond by, by how they respond to the gospel. They respond by repenting. They respond by repenting. I still believe that uh, believing, faith, and repentance are inseparable graces. That uh, repentance is is necessary to be saved. But I will say this: it's not what it's made out to be. It's not made out like that person has to turn from all their sins sinlessly, perfectly, and show you examples of how they've turned from all their sins and then. Later in their life, if they sin again and they truly didn't repent from their sins, I don't believe in that nonsense. I believe repentance is turning away from everything you were holding on to, everything that's keeping you away from a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and placing your faith in Jesus Christ alone. A Catholic needs to repent of Catholicism before they receive Jesus Christ. It's not taking Mary and Jesus. You repent from what you were trusting in, turn your back on it, turn to Christ, and accept him as the only way. I believe repentance is required. In Acts chapter 20, in verse number 21, the Bible says this. It says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's turning toward the Lord Jesus Christ as the only means of salvation. Brother Morton, you're preaching about the gospel, and we're, we're all pretty much church family here this morning. Well, people normally visit on Sunday morning, and I wanted to give uh, the gospel to people that if they're here today, and they don't know for sure that they're saved. It could be someone that has been coming for a while. And you've been struggling with it. You've been tossing and turning. And you don't know what to do. You've been dealing with it in your own heart. You know what you need to do is just respond in faith. Childlike faith. I've heard this. And it this breaks my heart. Because I believe this represents a common perception of coming to Christ. Dealing with someone at, the, at their door. And they, they quick to acknowledge their sin and their guilt and they realize that they can't save themselves i say wouldn't you like to just get saved today get that settled once and for all today why well, do but man maybe come back next week i got some things in my life i got to get straightened out and they feel they feel like they have to get their life worthy enough to receive the gift that they've been given and friend you don't have to wait to get your life all lined up you don't have to wait to get your life cleaned up. You know what the note God wants you to do this morning? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and began a personal relationship with Him, and you've been trusting in your religion, your denomination, your baptism, your christening, anything else, why don't you just come to Christ and let Him save you and then the Holy Spirit of God that now indwells you begins to make you into his likeness and image. People get the cart before the horse. They expect to be saved before they're saved. You know what? I believe this in terms of me being saved was instantaneous. The moment that I said, Lord, save me, I was instantly sanctified in terms of being saved. But do you know what? The daily sanctifica sanctification of living a separated holy life is a lifelong pursuit of mine. I am not going to be in an instant everything as a Christian that I ought to be. You know what that does? That takes time. That takes time. That takes the Holy Spirit of God taking me to the woodshed more times than I can count and saying, you need to get this right. You need to get that right. I can't believe you did that. You said that. You, I can't believe that. And, and correcting me, a lot of correction. Someone there that believes that they have to get their life all squared away. They see my wife and I. They see us wearing, you know, you know church-type clothes. And our kids at the moment were being decent and good and behaved. And we're not, you know, we didn't go up the door using foul language. And we're trying to be respectful and courteous to people. And they see uh, uh, 11 years of the Holy Spirit at work. And they think, somehow they think that they have to be like my wife and I to be saved. Friend, tell that to the Apostle Paul, who literally was on his way on the road to Damascus to kill and imprison Christians. And Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus and, and saved him from that. I'm telling you what, if you're here today and you've been hung up on not getting your life cleaned up enough for God to accept you, he wants to save you today. He is God enough to save you this very moment. If you'll let him. If I could have every head bowed, every eye closed, we'll have the musicians come forward. It's a two part challenge. Those, those of us that know Christ as our Savior, it's a challenge to us to get a burden for the lost family that we have, friends that we have, co workers, neighbors, you name it, that we know of that aren't saved. Get a burden, get a desire to reach those people with the gospel. The gospel. That is the most powerful thing that we have today. The gospel that can change lives. Save sinners. Get a burden for the lost. And if you're here today and don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, man, please let me encourage you. I'm not going to come to you, twist your arm, manipulate you, car salesman you. Be a car salesman and get you to walk down the aisle. I want the Holy Spirit of God to draw you and not me drawing you. But I want to challenge you, plead with you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, please let somebody take the Word of God, open it, and share with you the biblical gospel that could set you free, that can make you free this morning. Would you do business as soon as the 
the note, first notes play, the soon as the first word is sung, would you do business with the Lord this morning? You can come down the altar. We have workers here in the front that can take Bibles and show you how you can be saved. Would you do that this morning? Maybe you're here today and it's something else besides salvation. Maybe you've been saved, but you've not been biblically baptized. We can talk to you about that. We can schedule a time where we can fill the baptistry and, and baptize you when the Bible says. Maybe you're here today and you said, you know what? I, I want to I get plugged into a church and I want to know a little bit more about how to be a member of this church. Maybe you're here today and you've got a loved one you need prayer for. We're here to help you any way we can. Just do business with the Lord as he leads you and as he draws you. If you would, stand to your feet. We'll have the music play and the musicians lead us. You do business as the Lord leads you. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. Lord's Supper tonight, and I'm going to challenge you as a preacher that has to preach the whole Bible, before you observe the Lord's cup and take of his table, you need to make sure that you're not doing it unworthily. And I, I would hate to wait till moments before taking the cup and the bread to get things right in your life. If you have some things that you've not dealt with, some sin in your life that you haven't dealt with, I'd encourage you to do that before tonight, before tonight. Well, Pastor Mort, you're telling me that if I have sin in my life and I take it to the Lord's table, I could die? I'm not saying it would be that extreme, but the Bible says those have even slept because they've done that. I want to encourage you, just whatever is in your life that you've been holding on to, bitterness, anger, uh, jealousy, lying, lust, anything, get that confessed up. Because tonight want to be a beautiful thing where we remember Christ's sacrifice and his uh, death on the cross and his burial and resurrection. Make sure we have everything confessed up with the Lord. And this is a good opportunity to do that. As we sing, this will be a last verse. As we sing. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I Savior, I come to Thee. For a moment, we have some people that come down to the, uh, to the altar. I want to remind you, tonight is Ice Cream Social, so make sure you make plans to join us for that. And then keep the children's programs in your prayers. We have the bus ministry starting up. The first service that we're going to pick up is going to be June 19th. I did not realize that was Father's Day, but it's Father's Day, and so we're going to be picking up uh, bus kids for uh, Sunday on June 19th, so be in prayer as they come in, just smile, encourage them, and we're hoping to build. We had 17 the first day for Kids Club. We're shooting for 30 next week, and then we love to have about 45 the following week, and leading right into VBS, have about 80 would be great. We're hoping for 80 for VBS, and those 80 kids filter them to our bus and have if we had about 20, we'd be, that'd be awesome. But everything's building on top of the other, leading to VBS, leading to the bus ministry. And we're praying that you would just help us pray for that. So encouraged, so encouraged by the, the mail-out ministry, how much, how much benefit that's been. Uh, had some people visit our school because of that. And also um, kids that showed up at the, the kids club. We had 20-something sign up for the VBS online. And a lot of them said it was because of the mail-out. So you ladies that did that, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that and looking forward to a lot more fruit in the future. Brother Larrabee, would you mind doing me a favor? Would you mind uh, closes out in prayer, please? And then um, Brother Larrabee is going to be here um, for the, we're having a meal with all the teachers and families. He'll be here tonight. So make sure you go up to him, talk to him, meet him. And he's uh, praying about being the school administrator. And then um, he's flying out tonight, right? And you fly out at 930-ish. 
So he's got a long night, so be in prayer for him. Brother Larry, come dismiss the prayer, please. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the declaration of your word. We know that the power is in the word. We know that salvation from Christ is through the preaching of the word. Thank you for your faithful servant. Thank you for this church, for all that has taken place in this service. And Lord, if there's one person in the sound of my voice who has never truly trusted Christ, that you would open their eyes and help them to see the need and that the Holy Spirit would do his work as only he can. And Lord, those of us who know you, help us to appreciate what we have and to give you the reverence and the commitment, the obedience that you deserve. Now, Father, we pray for safety and guidance as we go to our homes. Pray that you would get the glory and honor through all that is said and done. In Jesus' name, amen.